my name's Eleanor and I'm the Education Manager at Benjamin Franklin House. Welcome to our very first virtual class. We're super excited that you can join us this afternoon. And we're going to be having one of these every Tuesday at 3pm. Each week we're going to look at one of Benjamin Franklin's inventions or scientific discoveries and thinking about what we can learn from them. This week's session is all about Ben Franklin and his lightning rod. Now we'd love to receive your comments and questions either as the session is going or at the end. If you're tuning in live, there are two ways that you can ask questions. The first way, and this is maybe the easiest way, is to use your raise hand button. So if you tap the bottom of the screen, you should see an icon that's a picture of a hand. And if you press that, my friend Caitlin, you should be able to see waving from her bubble, who also works at Benjamin Franklin House, um, will be able to unmute your microphone, and then you can ask a question, and I'll do my very best to answer it. The second way that you can ask a question is to use your Q&A button. So if you tap the bottom of your screen again, you should see another button that has um, two, a picture of two speech bubbles. And if you press that, you can type your question and then Caitlin will be able to read it out. And once again, I'll try my best to answer. We're recording this session today. So if you're actually watching it on YouTube, you can still ask questions by writing it as a comment underneath the video. And you can always get in touch with me by email, which you would send to education at benjaminfranklinhouse.org. So before I tell you the story of how Benjamin Franklin stole the lightning from the clouds with his lightning rod, let's find out a little bit more about the man he was and the reason there's a house in London which has been named after him. I'm going to use some pictures to help me, which Caitlin has very helpfully got up for us on the screen. So you should be able to see a picture of Ben. Uh, this is Benjamin Franklin. He was born on the 17th of January in 1706. So that's over 300 years ago. And he was born in a city called Boston, which is in America. His family was very big. He was one of 17 brothers and sisters, if you can imagine that. And his family didn't have a lot of money when he was growing up. And this meant that he could only be sent to school for two years. So from when he was eight to when he was 10. And then he had to go and start working. First of all, he worked for his father, who was a chandler, which means he made soap and candles. But even though Ben didn't go to school for very long, he loved reading and writing. And he kept teaching himself things all the way through his life. So his family decided that actually he might get along better working for his brother James, who was a printer. Now, I wonder if any of you know how they would have printed things like newspapers and books 300 years ago. They didn't have computers and they couldn't just press print to print things. So I wonder if anyone knows what machine they would have had to use to print things. So they had to use a machine which was called a printing press. And this worked a little bit like an ink stamp, but on a much bigger scale. And Ben Franklin was really good at printing, but he didn't always get along so well with his brother. So he ended up leaving Boston and moving to Philadelphia, which is another city in America. And there he started his own printing press and was really successful. But Ben Franklin had a long life. He lived to be 84. And um, in addition to being a printer, he was also a writer and a scientist and a politician. When Ben Franklin was born, uh, things were a little different, quite different, to how they are today. So America was not yet its own independent country. It was actually still part of England. And so that meant that Americans had to do what the king of England, at that time it was a king, not a queen, and the government told them to. So that was the main reason that Ben came to London. He came as a politician or a diplomat, and he was representing um, Americans and telling English people what they thought. So you should be able to see on the screen now the house that he lived in when he came to London. That's at 36 Craven Street, and we know it as Benjamin Franklin House today. If you've not been to visit us at Benjamin Franklin House before, we're right in the centre of London, uh, just around the corner from Trafalgar Square. And usually on a Tuesday, we have schools coming to visit us, or families coming to learn with us, which is why we've chosen Tuesday 
for our virtual classes and we hope you'll all be able to come and visit us in person at some point soon. So the main reason Franklin was here was that he was trying to settle a disagreement that was happening between America and England. And he arrived in 1757 and stayed for 16 years. But even after all that time and lots of hard work, the disagreement was really too big for him to solve. So when he left in 1775, uh, America and England went to war. And we call that war the War of Independence. And that's when America broke away and became its own independent country. And you may have heard of Americans celebrating something called Independence Day on the 4th of July. And this day marks when Ben Franklin, along with some other people, signed something called the, De the Declaration of Independence. And this is when America was saying that it wanted to be an independent country and make up its own rules. And because of Franklin's important role in that, um, we remember him as one of the founding fathers of the United States. So, now we know a bit more about Ben's life, but you can find out plenty more on our website, www.benjaminfranklinhouse.org. We're going to turn now to his science and especially his interest in electricity and lightning. So on the screen now, you should be able to see a picture of what was probably Ben Franklin's most famous experiment. It's called his kite and key experiment. So Ben Franklin was completely fascinated with electricity and so were lots of other scientists when he was alive in the 18th century. At that time, people didn't know a lot about electricity yet and they weren't sure of the connection between lightning and electricity. So this is what Ben Franklin wanted to prove with his height and key experiment. So he did this in 1752, which was about five years before he came to live in London. And as you can see in the picture, he went out into a storm. He had um, his son William with him. And he took also a, a kite, and on the kite was a metal wire. And then at the bottom of the long string of the kite, there was a metal key. Now, luckily for Franklin, the kite didn't get struck by lightning. That would have been incredibly dangerous, and um, we should never try and recreate this experiment ourselves. But he did observe a couple of things happening. The first thing he saw happening was that some of the loose threads on the string were starting to stand on end. And then he put his finger near the key and a spark jumped to his finger. So he was showing that lightning was behaving and causing things to behave just like electricity did. And also that it could travel down to the ground or be conducted down to the ground. You may have heard the word to conduct before. It means when uh, electricity can travel through something. And we'll come back to that later in the session because it's really important. So once he'd found all this out, Ben Franklin was determined to use this information to help people because that's what he liked to do. He liked to fix things and make things better for people. So now on the screen, you should be able to see on the left um, that's some of Ben Franklin's writing about his discoveries about electricity and also a little diagram of what the lightning rod would have looked like. And I'm going to explain how it works in a moment. The other picture you can see is the first building in London where they put up a lightning rod. So as soon as Benjamin Franklin went to the lightning rod, it was very cold there. It was so helpful and it stopped um, houses being set on fire by lightning which was a problem at the time. So I wonder if any of you recognize um, the building that you can see in the picture. It's in the center of London. You may even have been to visit it. It's also the cathedral. And they first like in Royal Cathedral, but it was the tallest building in the city at the time. So now we found out more about Ben Franklin's um, lightning experiments, this is lightning and um, lightning rod. I'm going to use an object that I have with me in the museum to help me explain um, how it would work. Here I have a lightning rod, or in fact, it's a replica of one of Ben Franklin's lightning rods. Now, I wonder if you've heard that word before, a replica. So a replica is like a copy. It looks like the old version of the lightning rod, but it was actually made only a few years ago. 
So the way it would have worked is it would have had to be attached right at the top of the building. Uh, in fact, it would need to go higher than the roof because lightning tends to strike the highest point. And we've got these holes here, so it could be fixed in with nails. And then there's some wire coming out here as well. So there would have been more wire that would have been flexible and would have gone down the side of the house and into the ground. So what was supposed to happen is that the lightning would strike the rod and then because it's a conductor, it would have traveled all the way down the wire and into the ground and that would protect the building, stop it from being set on fire. So I wonder if you've learned a little bit about what materials are conductors, which means they let electricity pass through them. And maybe if you have a think about what material this is probably made out of, I wonder if you know. The opposite of conductor is what we call an insulator. So materials like plastic and wood that don't let electricity pass through them, we know as insulators. But lightning rods uh, need to be made out of metal, which you may have guessed, um, because metal is a really good conductor of electricity. Okay, so now we've learned all about Benjamin Franklin's experiments with lightning and how he invented the lightning rod. You may be thinking, but how does lightning work? So we're going to try and answer that question and to do that we have to understand more about static electricity because lightning is actually a form of static electricity. So to help me explain I'm going to be using this balloon. Now all objects like this balloon are made up of tiny particles called atoms and in the atoms we have um, protons which have a positive charge and electrons which have a negative charge. And most objects, um, like this balloon is at the moment, are neutrally charged normally because they have an equal amount of positive protons and negative electrons. However, sometimes um, objects can, be, can pick up charge and that often happens through friction. So you may have done this before at home. If, you, if I start rubbing this balloon against my hair, then I am starting to give it a negative charge. And that's because some of the electrons that are in my hair are passing into the balloon and it's becoming negatively charged. And then that's making my hair positively charged because it's losing those electrons. So I bet you can all predict what's going to happen when I start to take the balloon away from my hair. Yes, the hair sticks to it. And that's because um, opposite charges attract, a bit like when you have a north pole of a magnet and a south pole of a magnet, they pull together or attract. Okay. And you may have had, when you've, when you've had balloons, or this can also happen with jumpers, or when you've walked across a carpeted floor, you may have sometimes experienced getting a small electric shock. And that's just like what's happening with lightning, but with lightning it happens on a much bigger scale. So let's think about what's happening in those storm clouds. When um, clouds go really high up in the air, it gets very cold, and the water vapor inside them freezes. And because of the wind in the storm, those frozen particles are moving around really quickly and bumping into each other and rubbing against each other, a bit like we saw happening with, with the balloon in my hair. And because of that, they're getting charged. So the particles that get positively charged go up towards the, um, the top of the, of the cloud, and those that get negatively charged go down to the bottom of the cloud. And then um, the, the charge, they're, they're jumping between the charge, we have these um, electrical sparks. So most lightning actually happens inside clouds, um, but we also get it jumping between clouds and the ground. And the reason that happens is because of this buildup of negative charge at the bottom of the cloud, that encourages positive charge to, grow, to develop and grow on the ground. And then they're reaching towards each other and when they meet, we have a big flash of lightning. And that's why we have lightning happening in nature. So now I've explained a little bit more about lightning. Let's, um, we're gonna, I'm going to show you some simple demonstrations um, that you can try at home. You may want to do them as we go along, or you may want to wait until the end of the class to have a go yourselves. So to do these demonstrations, you're gonna need a few simple objects. You're gonna need two balloons and then some small pieces of paper that you've ripped up. You can just use um, scrap paper for this and then a metal spoon as well. So first of all, we'll just take the balloon, I'll take the other one actually that I haven't 
use of my hair. So at the moment, this balloon is neutrally charged. So let's have a think about what will happen. It's not exerting forces on, on the things around it. So if I put it against the wall, it's not getting pulled towards the wall or pushed away from it. And if I let go, it's just going to fall because of gravity. Now, if I put it over these pieces of paper, nothing happens. And if I put it next to the other balloon, they're quite happy to be sat next to each other. Lastly, if I put the spoon next to the balloon, nothing happens there either. Now, I'm going to give this balloon some negative charge by rubbing it against my hair once again. So as I'm doing that, getting it all charged up, I wonder if you can make a prediction. So I'm going to repeat all of those things I just did. And I wonder if you can predict how it's going to change, what's going to be different once the balloon is negatively charged. Making sure it's really charged up. First, we're going to put it against the wall. Okay, so if you've charged it up enough, and I think we can see from my hair that it's pretty well charged now, um, it should stick against the wall. So as well as being attracted to my um, positively charged hair, the balloon gets attracted as well to the neutrally charged wall. Let's see also what will happen when I put it over the paper now. So this time, I can make the paper start to levitate. So a bit like I was saying, Wingardium Leviosa, for those Harry Potter fans amongst you, um, the levitating spell. So now for the next uh, part of the demonstration, we're going to need to charge up both balloons. So we're going to have to look a bit silly doing this, but that's fine. So we're going to charge them both up at the same time. And then they're going to become, they're both going to become negatively charged. So I wonder if you can make a prediction this time about what's going to happen when I put them next to each other. So to help you with this prediction, have a think about what happens when you have two light poles on a magnet next to each other. So two north poles or two south poles. What happens? Now, if I put them together, they are not happy to be next to each other. They're starting to push each other away. Okay. And that's because opposite, part, uh, opposite charges um, push each other apart or repel each other. Okay, and for the last one, we're going to take the metal spoon and we're actually going to use the balloon to recreate on a small scale what happens with Benjamin Franklin when he went and put his finger near the, um, the metal key when he did his kite and key experiment. So this is going to be quite hard for you to hear and see on the video, but hopefully you'll be able to hear and see it when you do it at home. So if I bring the um, spoon near to the balloon, should be able to hear a little crack, um, a bit like if you're eating Rice Krispies or something. And if you're in a dark room, you should even be able to see a very little spark. So a little bit like what happens with lightning, but on a smaller scale. So with those demonstrations, that brings us to the end of our lesson today. I really hope you've enjoyed learning about um, a bit more about Benjamin Franklin and his inventions, uh, particularly his lightning rod. And I do hope you are going to have fun um, recreating those demonstrations at home. Um, do let us know if you have any questions.